Dok se panelisti polako povlače sa scene, ja ću najaviti naš treći panel za danas. Obratite pažnju. Održiva urbanizacija je ključ održivog razvoja naše civilizacije. Neophodan je novi ciklus tehnoloških i društvenih inovacija za pametne gradove budućnosti. Na panelu čija je tema pametni gradovi, panelisti će govoriti o tome na koji način upotreba novih tehnologija omogućava država rešenja za probleme urbane mobilnosti, logistike, proizvodnje, ekologije, snabdevanja energijom i vodom, kao i drugih. Pogledajmo filmski intro u treći panel za danas. Ovako je čuveni austrijski reditelj Fritz Lang 1927. godine u filmu Metropolis video istoimeni grad budućnosti 2026. godine, dakle za osam godina od sada. Kako će za sedam, zapravo bližimo se 2019. godini, izgledati gradovi budućnosti? Prema projekcijama Ujedinjenih nacija do 2050. godine u gradovima će živeti 70% svetske populacije. Danas taj procenat iznosi 52%. Odgovor na ovo i druga pitanja na temu Smart Cities daće nam učesnici narednog panela. Pozivam gospodina Tonija Richarda, Chris Olija i njegove sagovornike da zaupravo uzmu mest. Gospodine Krisole, izvolite. Dobar dan svima. Mi ćemo... Ovaj panel držati na engleskom jeziku jer ćemo imati dva govornika koji naš jezik ne razume. Tako da ja se nadam da je to u redu. Ako nemate slušalice, molim vas uzimati ih sada jer ćemo nastaviti ovaj panel na oficijalnom jeziku u svakoj konferenci. To je Broken English, odnosno u mom slučaju sa nemačkim akcentom. All right, I think we're going to switch to English with this presentation. We are still missing one of our panelists, but I think we are going to find him. So, the, let me introduce myself. My name is Tony Cazzoli. I've come to the region 20 years ago, and for 16 years I'm working in the Western Balkans on education, informal education. Informal education in my case means we work with stakeholders and decision makers on all kinds of levels in all the countries here in the region. Our goal is to enable them to make better decisions. And smart cities, digital transformation, and all the other buzzwords we have used here today are basically at the very core of what we are trying to achieve here in the region. So um, we are also, uh, I'm also founder of the uh, Smart City Education Initiative, which is basically um, the part which deals with smart city educational programs here in the Western Balkans, which have been founded in Belgrade in 2013, and which has now actually become a global movement being translated in many, many countries all over the world, basically 70 countries all over the world, which just shows me 
very vividly that uh, many, many good things are happening here in the Western Balkans. I can tell you so much as somebody who still considers himself as a foreigner. And we are going to look now at the places where we live. Because we have discussed Industry 4.0, we have discussed digital transformation, we have discussed, you know, virtual reality and whatever. I mean, all the nice, cool words. But in the end, if you break it down, what really matters to us as individuals and what matters to us as a society is what benefit can we reap from this? Because at the end, how nice our industry is, how nice our companies is, we, come, we want to come home to our, our families. We want to live in a place which is, uh, is good to us. Uh, we want to live in cities which simply allowing us to, 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 to live all our potentials and, and do so in, in a way that is also interesting. So basically, I'm going to uh, introduce the panelists we have here now. Here. Thank you very much for coming. I have to read this because I'm pretty bad with, with names, so uh, apologies for that. We have Janko Pavlovich here. Janko is, is uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Digital Works. We believe that this company actually at some point is going to be one of these many hidden champions we will see here in the Western Balkans and see in Serbia. Uh, one of the topics they're working on is, of course, Industry 4.0 and Internet of Things. So basically, uh, one, they're developing the backbones for many of the solutions we've discussed here today. And thank you very much for being here on the panel with us. Uh, the other domestic friend we have here is, of course, Sergen Vukmirovic. He described himself as a full-time professor at the, uh, at the Faculty of Technical Science in Novi Sad. But he's also actually somebody who is for many, many years, more than a decade, with Schneider Electrics. He's not only a consultant, but also leads several of the projects. I've discussed with him many, many you know, of the things we're going to discuss here now. I'm really looking forward to your input because I think you really cover uh, several sectors here which are key. Uh, Camille is coming from Camille Shudorsky. Oh, thank you so much. I was practicing it's so hard. Uh, he is actually coming from Inno Energy, from uh, EIT. He's working on regional development and public affairs. Uh, he's a lawyer by profession, and I think you deal also with, uh, with uh, energy efficiency and topics like that. I think it's really important to have a lawyer here and somebody who does lobbying, who does communications. is really, really important here. So thank you very much for co coming to Belgrade, all from Warsaw. Uh, we appreciate it very much. And the last person here uh, is Anton Petrakov. I'm really happy that you're here because he's coming from Yandex Taxi. Uh, everybody, I think, here knows Yandex as a company, one of the most uh, well-known technology companies uh, in the world. Uh, you've just launched your services here recently, so we can already see that the services you've launched here in Serbia are already improving how we actually move from one point to, to the other. Uh, you're improving how we interact with taxi drivers and how we get our taxis. This, the guys from Belgrade know that this is sometimes a very painful process and I think you're uh, improving much of this experience. So thank you very much for being here with us on the panel. You've also been working in the Czech Republic as an attaché and you're also doing a lot of lobbying work, discussion work. You, I think you bring it together, not only uh, gov governments, you bring them together with, with companies. So this dialogue, is, is really, really important here. So, let's dive into, into the city. Uh, the city of the future, and the problem I very often have in my work is when we talk about smart cities. When we started talking about smart cities in 2013, the reaction of many people was, ha, 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 this is the Balkans. What smart cities? There was a wrong perception about what a smart city is. And I think the term itself is not really useful in communicating uh, what this better improved city could be for us, especially here in the region where we have so many more problems than, you know, uh, than upgrading our cities with technology. There are so many more problems, we, uh, and people have so many more uh, issues in their lives that they cannot really focus on this, and I think the, the term is wrong. But if you break it down differently, if you try to explain what this actually means, you, everybody will really quickly understand that a smart city is basically just a city which improves uh, while using the technology, while the, using the, t the tools at hand to solve problems which everybody feels in their, in, in their life every day. 
And I, I would like actually to go just through the round very quickly because you all come from very different backgrounds. You're doing a, a very important uh, uh, things. You're like uh, dealing with energy efficiency and so on and so on. You're dealing with mobility. Just to explain very quickly to us what are you doing and how is your war work impacting life of citizens and you know, what, what is the, in a nutshell, what is this? Do you want to start from here? Perfect, yeah, definitely. Thank you very much for a kind introduction, Tony. And um, yeah, so just to explain my perspective of smart city as brief as possible is actually that is a responsive city, okay? So uh, I'm talking on behalf of the Things Network Belgrade here more than uh, on behalf of Digital Works at the moment. And then we are a smart city organization gathered uh, around technology so-called LoRa one okay so it's a long-range wide area network and uh, what we are actually doing is that we are a non-profit organization which is uh, just placing the development where it belongs so that is just to the enthusiasts and to the startups which are involved into the ecosystem so okay what does the smart city mean for me is actually Okay, that is a smart thing at first. If we go from the definition of a smart thing, then okay, that means that is a thing which can think. Yeah, so it is like it has some process of uh, making a decision based on some conditions. So if we just translate that into the city level, we are going to get okay, this is the city which is just uh, having a correlation with its participants and the participants are all the citizens and all the other things which are smart. So we are just connecting everything there and then everything responds to one another. And what I would like to, to just uh, point out here is actually that the citizens are not only the users and customers of the smart city, but they are participants in it. So you are just walking the street and the city is going just to uh, adjust to your needs. Thank you. Uh, as Pamela said, I, I am Stadjanuk Mirovic from University of Novi Sad. I'm there a professor of computer science, but I'm here in front of the Schneider Electric DMS. That is the biggest software company in, in Novi Sad, more than a thousand employees. And we are working on the smart product that, that optimizes the use and transportation of electrical energy, power energy from generator to you. And it is part of the smart grid. And the smart grid is one of the key component of the smart city because we want to have better power supply, more reliable and, and with, with better characteristics. And smart city basically for me is uh, providing the services that, that we all need either in the better way, like better uh, parking services, better transportation services, or by introducing new services that we don't have and we need and it will, in the, in the short, in the long term, improve our style of living and give us more free, free time and a better service. Can you give an example how this actually works in real time? I mean, if you, we always have to explain it to our citizens in a very simple way. Can you, in one or two sentences, explain what's going to be better in terms of, you know, maybe money, saving money or something like that? Can, can you explain it in two sentences? I would like to say that the money is the last thing that we will improve. For example, today I have looked for a parking in Belgrade for more than a, one hour. So it was very difficult for me and very annoying. So, it's, for example, a system that will give me better information where is the free parking, it will improve my living and I will be more often here in Belgrade. That is one of the things why don't come here uh, that often. So basically, existing services will be improved, uh, information will be better, better used, uh, existing services like, as I say, parking, transport. It is not, uh, when we say smart city, it does not have to mean that it is complicated. Some, some even small solution can improve our lives in, 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 in uh, different aspects. So it doesn't have to be complicated, it doesn't have to be technology advanced. Maybe we don't need the blockchain in order to have better parking in, in Belgrade. We can do that even without the blockchain or new technology. So adding new services or improving the existing one, that is the smart city. Thank you so much. 
Camille. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kamil Szydłowski. I work for Inner Energy Central Europe. This is an investment fund run by EIT. You've already heard uh, Martin Kern, our director, uh, who probably described the concept of, of EIT and how we work. But I want to say that Inner Energy is an investment fund. That's something that uh, you should remember because we invest in technology that comes to with innovation, which means that we are looking for more promising technologies. We are looking for entrepreneurs who, who want to real, really make a change. And we offer them not only financial support, of course, this is part of the game because you can actually apply for, uh, for the funding, but also we offer uh, most of the coaching sessions, most of the business developer support, which is actually, in my opinion, even more important than, uh, than the financial support because uh, our office is responsible for the whole uh, Central Eastern Europe. We are located in Krakow in Poland, but uh, our responsibility goes from, from Estonia up to, uh, through Serbia up to Turkey and Cyprus, so we are responsible for uh, changing the innovation and changing our lives in energy sector uh, in the whole region. Uh, I want to just say that our goal is not only to find innovation, but uh, we are also uh, expecting the cashback from this investment, as, as only as every investment fund does. We are also looking for some uh, some cashback for this investment. So uh, probably it will go a little bit later, but I just want to say that as far as innovation has become a kind of a buzzword, we should also remember that innovation and uh, smart city as well, because that's the part of this game, should be also made very wisely. It's not only about changing just for a change. It's really about making it very, uh, very wisely in terms of investment and impact at the same time. For instance, we've got plenty of great uh, technologies, but only if they made a change in a wisely in a financial manner that it comes with the uh, societal needs as well. That's what a smart city and that's what smart innovation means. It's not just change for making a change. So uh, I hope to have a discussion later. So just very shortly, I describe what I do. And um, also I will introduce uh, in the energy later on if you advise me to. Thank you so much. Uh, well, hi everyone. First of all, uh, thank you for having me here. That's my first time in Belgrade and uh, I'm pretty much amazed by, amazed by the city and uh, uh, I think the conference is very interesting here. Um, well, I represent here Yandex and Yandex Taxi. What Yandex used to be a couple of years ago, it's been a search giant, search engine, the main in Russia and CIS countries, but then we actually understood that our technologies, machine learning, artificial intelligence, algorithms, and so on, can be used in uh, other spheres which are more offline. Uh, then we went having Yandex Taxi to the ride-sharing services, then we went to e-commerce, making clouds and uh, uh, some other things, online mapping and so on and so on. Um, and uh, as we are going deeper into this offline world, having the application which applications, number of applications, which uh, actually help people um, make their, their life more convenient and uh, to do some things more simpler and cheaper. Uh, we are, of course, having a very profound dialogue with the governments and uh, local officials. And, uh, of course, with businesses where we bring technologies and where we are uh, helping to make some things more efficient. So from the side of the citizen, I would say that the smart city is not the city which is full of, I don't know, some electronic st stuff, but this is the city which is efficient, flexible, and uh, uh, citizen-friendly, I would say, which allows me to make uh, my life more simple, more, more comfortable. From the side of uh, the big company, which operates, talking about the index tech scene, 15 countries and uh, hundreds of cities. Uh, of course, we want the decisions to be more, once again, flexible and more IT and tech oriented. So uh, the people who take the decisions shall understand that uh, the smart city can't be built by the companies or can't be created by citizens. That's the dialogue and the ongoing uh, working together on different projects and helping with the data exchange, with uh, more flexible tariffs or more flexible taxation and so on in order to make all the area more comfortable and more convenient. 
Thank you so much. I mean, you've just opened a couple of, of points for me, and uh, some of them I like more than others. But you said several times, you know, it needs people to work together. I mean, uh, citizens to work together. This can be businesses. This can be decision makers. This can be citizens walking the street, you know, being part of this old data thing, providing data passively, using data that's been provided to them to, to know, maybe solve an issue, find a place, what's on, and so on and so on. So for me, this works really nice in, in theory. That you know, everybody comes together and works together and you know, we're going to build a smart city together. Um, working in this field, from my perspective, which is you know, decision making, this is not that easy, obviously. Uh, if it were that easy, we would have so many more smart city initiatives right now here. This, this, is, this is my belief. Uh, but this is not, not happening. What, what is, what are the, the things that slow down smart city development from your personal experience? What is it what, what hinders us to rush forward and, and just build these places? What are the obstacles? And don't say money, because money is never really an excuse. I don't know who wants. Frisian, you want to do it? Maybe I can start. I, I will uh, give another question. What is the obstacle for innovation. In, in, and smart city is one part. We are today on the day of innovation. And I think that the biggest obstacle in, in our countries with Balkan is failure, is, is, is uh, fear? fear of failure, of course. Fear of failure because in Serbia, if you fail, you're a loser. In USA, uh, if you fail, that's okay. If you've done your best, if, if you had everything on place and the market was not there, it's okay, you can start again next year and, and have a new idea. In Serbia, in, in, at least in my generation, in the older generation, one of the greatest things is, is, is fear of failure. One of, part of it is the money. Of course, if you lose your money, nobody, it is it's difficult to start all over again. But I think that in our culture, fear of failure is the most important uh, thing for, for, for innovations, for startups, for for innovation in universities, in, in, in cities, and everywhere. <laughs> I don't know if you, if you know this format, but it's called Fuck Up Nights, and it's being organized in, in, in Serbia for a year and a half, which basically allows young entrepreneurs to, to share their failures, um, and share with others without shame. And actually, this is a bragging right. You, when, you, when you watch Shark Tank on TV, something like this, shows like that, and you have the perfect team, you have the perfect idea, a working prototype, and then the sharks ask them, have you ever failed? And they say proudly, no, we have not failed. And then, then they say, thank you. You have to fail. You have to have this experience uh, in order to, 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 to grow. Because if you, if you haven't, failed, haven't experienced failure, you're not ready yet. You're not ready for the market. And I think you are really right here that this is a... This is a thing that holds back smart city development. And this is not, this of course can be uh, this heritage we have, certainly. When you go to Tel Aviv, if you go to Israel, you know, failure is not that, uh, not such a bad thing. You know, you have many entrepreneurs there, most of them have failed, and you know, everybody likes to have a good story how they failed and they, how they came back. In Serbia, this is not yet there, but this is not only Serbia, this is the whole region. I think that many, many regions in the world where failure is not yet been accepted, but I can understand why this is with politics. Because if you fail, you know, you're not going to get re-elected. I think the uh, decision makers are in a very bad position. Because if they fail, they lose their job. And this is also, this one, certainly one of the reasons why they don't go forward. But we have two gentlemen here sitting at the end, which actually, I think you talk to these guys, you have to talk to these people, you know, you, how do you overcome this fear of, you know, I don't really want to fail here, because, you know, if I do, I lose my job, I, I, I destroy my, my, my political career, whatever career it is, it's easier, you know, there are other shortcuts to get re-elected, you know, not smart city ideas. How do you can, you, can you take this fear away? Can you, you know, lower it somehow, make it less painful? Of course, there's no one best solution because everyone is different and every case is different. But uh, what I want to say is that the biggest 
slower down, let's say, the biggest obstacle, in my opinion, is the amount of the money on the market. That's something probably really not, uh, not that popular, but I really believe that there is enough money for the market to make innovation. Probably it's not only for Serbia, as far as you're not the member of the EU, but for example in Poland or in all the EU uh, member countries, there are so plenty of sources where you can apply for money, where you can get the money for innovation, that it really gets enough for the whole possible solutions we are looking for. The problem is that it's too easy to apply and it's too easy to get it. Which means that we are, we've got many of people who are just kind of, let's call me then, uh, the, the granting surfers. So people who are only looking for funding, but not really looking for solutions. So in many, for many entrepreneurs and for many politicians as well, of course, the goal is just to get the funding, is just to get the impression that you're doing something, to be in the process but not truly really make a change. Because if you are in the process, so if you are in the very beginning, you got the, the granting, you got the money, you got the support, but when you really get the solution, when you really get the product, there is no more incentives because that's where the hard work starts. That's where you really have to sell your product, where it's the moment where you really have to find clients, go to the market, talk to people. So I think that the, the biggest failure that, that probably we've done in the past is that we were really incentivizing the process, but not the exact outcome of this process. So I would say that this is the very, um, the, the very best problem and how we overcome this, this problem, because that's what you asked for, is that we are really not promising anything to our uh, ventures. We are saying that if you are looking for the easy money, there are m plenty of best places to go that's in energy, but when you're looking for smart money, so if you're looking for contacts, if you're looking for networking, if you're looking for business developers who are really, really working with you at place, helping to establish a meeting for you, if you are looking for people who are really advising how to make your idea into a product, then you know, energy is a place to be. But if you are just looking for funding, just to live your life for 10 years just on the budgetary issues, then really you should try in other places to, to be. Thank you so much. Anto, you want to add to this one? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I would divide this topic into, let's say, two, two parts. The first one, um, the innovation itself, well, there, is a, there could be a perception that innovation itself, when there is no demand on this and uh, there is no final user or final, I don't know, buyer, supplier, uh, there is no need in such innovation. That's not right. Uh, we in Yandex Taxi are testing dozens of theories, dozens of projects and uh, pro um, uh, ideas inside the team where the perception of the innovation is more like friendly than in the in normal world. Uh, and of course this filter um, gives us an opportunity to be uh, like more critical and uh, to think uh, in the longer distance. For instance, a couple of months ago we launched the self-driving car in Moscow and a couple of cities um, uh, near Moscow in Tatarstan. Then we got the uh, governmental decision to um, make the tests of self-driving cars um, available on the normal streets in, uh, in the city without the driver. So could we, how could, could we achieve this? Uh, firstly, we tested the technology inside the company. Then we went to the government and said, well, you know, we are not like idiots. Of course, we understand that there are risks, there are some security issues, there are ethical issues that we have to tackle and discuss. But without testing the technology, we can't make the breakthrough in two or five years, in ten years. So we have to, to, to make this step by step. Uh, then, let's say, um, the obstacle of innovation is uh, that we don't hear and don't understand the real um, things people want. Uh, in, our, in our world of taxis, ride-sharing, uh, we have to closely communicate with drivers because these are the people who actually make the service of ride sharing via application available, comfortable, cheaper, more convenient, more secure, and so on. So we have to uh, like uh, not only say that, well, guys, uh, you have to work this way or that way. We are changing algorithms. We have to say. Uh, 
well, you have to earn money, more money than now. Uh, this algorithm can provide you with more work. Of course, you can start working, like not waiting for the order for a long time. You have to work more and drive more, but finally you earn more money. And uh, uh, via this discussion and via this explanation, you can achieve some breakthrough in such difficult areas as, for instance, ride sharing and as we are having this. Thank you so much. You just opened uh, another door for me here, and this is a very important door, and I think many of you can relate to this one. Too. Um, and this is how can actually a city, how can the you know, local city administration, how can maybe the government or institutions actually help you? You are there to help your citizens. You're there also to make money. This is, this is all fine. This is a fair game. Nobody should, you know, nobody should blame you for that. It's needed. But uh, the city maybe cannot finance you directly, you know, or, or help you financially, but they can do many, many other things to make your life so much easier. One of the things I think where a city is ideal is it's an ideal test bed. There are citizens there. You can test your solution. You can prove your ideas in a city. Um, I know that when I want to fly my drone here in Serbia, basically I can't because, you know, law says I can't and that's it. And now you're coming with a self-driving car and say, I would, I would like to, you know, test it somewhere in the streets in real life uh, environment. You know, I think in most countries you will get the answer no. Um, what, what, uh, what institutions can do is actually help you somehow. Understand that this is actually needed. This will, in the long run, help you to develop better cars, self-driving, reliable cars, and who knows what other solutions. Um, how do, we, how do we get there? How can we create this awareness? You know, how can we get the other side actually help you, help you more? I mean, you're also working on IoT solutions. I mean, I, I think it's quite difficult, especially when you work with, you know, lower uh, IoT technology and so on, you know. Are you, are you facing open doors? Is, is, are the institutions coming your way saying, I want to help you, or is it a little bit different? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So it is kind of difficult. And what is going on? We are having all those challenges we've mentioned. And, uh, okay, if we just sum it up, we are just like in collaboration. And since we are all having different perspectives, we cannot really move into the, the, the general topic. So, okay, yeah, in terms of uh, our work, we are facing a lot of challenges and obstacles because, okay, uh, all the co co uh, corporations which could use our solutions, they are just afraid of going into it by not knowing what they are going to get. And the situation is, okay, but can you show me that somewhere already working, do you have a pilot project? And then we founded the Things Network just for that reason. Okay, let's gather all the startups. Let's make an infrastructure which is going to be available to them to test their mm -hmm. solutions. Okay, and that is going to happen on a private area where we don't need any of the, uh, like, we don't have legal restrictions there. And then what is going on? We can create really a whole ecosystem. So you are all invited to, to join us. And yeah, let's find out what's the best way how we can actually make it. Because we are waiting for the government to react. It's just a reactive way. And we are just in an uh, entrepreneurship world. So it is expected from our side that we are proactive. So I believe it is going to be best just to go just directly into it. You said it's difficult. I mean, what's the experience of the others here? I mean, is this, uh, is this a difficult thing? Or are actually, you know, is the other side, or the other side actually coming your way, offering you a hand and saying, okay, let, let's, let's try to work together. And if not, I mean, how, how can we get there? Uh, the problem with the smart cities is that you're offering the services that citizens already paid for through their taxes to the government. So there is not a lot of money that they, they will uh, give additional for tra transport information, parking information. So the government or the city have to help startups, but they can help in more than one way, not just with money, but also in Novista there is a, the startup incubator that is very almost free or, or, or very, very low for payment. Uh, they can give you with, with tax reliefs for employees. Uh, they can give you test beds, as, as you said, to, to test your solutions because it is also expensive. So it is much easier to get this kind of help from, from government than the money. The funds are really low for, for these startups, but because 
and you cannot ask it from, from a citizens because that is the part of the city tax that they are already paying for. So we have some, some initiative uh, to, that can help startups in smart city, but there can always be more, and it should be more. Camille, do you want to add to this one? Yeah, I'm working with, with authorities, with public officials, actually day by day, so I'm, I'm always having the same answer to this question, so why innovate? I'm always saying that innovation is about solving problems, and solving people with problems is about winning the election. That's what I'm always saying, because if you really solve people's problems, you are not only solving these people's problems, but also your own. Because it's not about paying more for electricity because we need more electricity. It's about spending it wisely again. It's about spending it in a different way. So that's how technology can help you, not only to minimize the cost of electricity so that people will be happy and people will vote for you next election, but it's also about saving in your bank account of your municipality. So it's just your discount as well. So if you want to really solve people's problems, you at the same time by innovation solve your own problems. And uh, I'm always saying also that, uh, for instance, many technologies from our portfolio, one of them is Gradis, one of the Polish company that uh, helps uh, municipalities to, uh, to install and to design the lightning system, so outdoor lightning system. Through this thing, they not only decrease the amount of electricity bills that people pay, but at the same time, they have decreased the bills of the municipality itself. So for this money that people have saved, they can also use for further investments. So innovation is not only about solving financial problems, it's about winning elections, I may say. Absolutely. Uh, if I can, yeah? yeah uh, I'll give you some concrete example on uh, how the long-term interests and long-term goals of the, let's say, government officials uh, are in a long distance meeting the business interests. Um, eight years ago, uh, the Moscow government looked at the street and said, well, we have a catastrophe here. We have lots of cars, we have poor transportation system, uh, we have traffic jams, we have inefficient public transportation, uh, we have cheap and old metro, uh, and we have illegal taxis. Um, and started their own step-by-step -step policy on improving this situation, like building streets, building roads, uh, uh, subsidizing new businesses in taxi and so on. Um, then we as a company launched absolutely, like independently, our own business, Yandex Taxi. Uh, and then at the, at the first meeting, we said, well, guys, you know, we see that uh, actually there is a very shadow segment of taxi in, in Moscow, and you can't. Uh, like influence this part of market. Of course, you can give money to legal ones, you can uh, make rules for them, but there is a shadow segment, you, you, you have no influence in like uh, quickly uh, make something good in this sphere. Then we started working together, exchanging data, statistics, uh, somehow synchronizing our steps in uh, uh, development of, the, of, the, of this sphere. What we have as a result now, we have 95% of legal taxis in Moscow. We have the price of taxi, uh, I guess, two or three times lower than eight years ago. And at the same time, the driver earns three or two times more money. And for example, uh, the taxi here in Belgrade is even more expensive than a taxi in Moscow, as though the salaries are much more higher there. So that's how the, the dialogue should be, should be implemented and used. That there is, a, we actually, uh, every time we are on the one side, we want to make people, people's life better. The government wants to solve their problems and be reelected, and we want to earn our money. And that's, that's all about dialogue, and you are not correct about saying that that's uh, actually not the, uh, the easy way. It's not the easy way, but the, the most efficient one. I mean, uh, don't talk about taxi drivers and taxi lobbies. You know, we, we know them very well. And uh, it's a big problem in Serbia. I mean, uh, I travel a lot and all the time, you know, I, I, I land at the airport and I get, you know, snatched by some guy offering me a taxi, um, which is not an official taxi driver. He's just trying to snatch me. These guys are there for, for I don't know, ever since I'm here. Still they are harassing people. And nobody can solve the problem. And it's just for me a one, you know, 
there are, there are groups which are, you know, you know, unconstitutional veto players in, 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 in a city or in a country. They, they, they have some power, but they shouldn't have them. They shouldn't have it. How do you deal with something like this? How do you deal with, you know, uh, monopolistic groups that, you know, simply don't want innovation to invade their business space? Because if you bring innovation, if you bring dig digital tools into it, things suddenly become transparent. If they are transparent, you can't do things which maybe you were doing before. It's simple. If you open it up, it creates competition. That's the last thing you want. So how do you deal with something like that? When, when there is a strong group, a group which opposes what needs to be done, how do you deal with that? Well, I just br briefly describe our another experience. A um, couple of years ago, we started an experiment called Yandex Health. It was a telemedicine service which can uh, connect the user with a doctor online, uh, have the discussion, the diagnosis, and so on. We started to test this, and of course, the laws are not ready for this. The doctors uh, are, are not ready for this. Um, I don't know, psychologists are not ready for, for this. It's not about being inefficient or being not transparent. It's uh, just about not being ready to um, use innovations in a broader way. So we started step by step explain what we are doing, why we are doing this. We asked people, do you want this? What service should be? We started to ask doctors, what's comfortable usage of this application uh, for you to be like, feel more comfortable? Step by step being more like online, step by step having more services online. Uh, and that's like uh, being a big company uh, is, is a good one doing this innovation because it's a, it's a, it's a long trip. Being a startup is a bad way because uh, you can't like um, just lose money uh, doing something which is not popular. But then, of course, there is a breakthrough somewhere in, in that spot. And uh, either you wait for this and make the market like ready for this, or you should make more simple things. You, you are, you're also talking about getting back information. Getting back information in the, in the digital age is getting data of people. You know, the data we need to, to, to understand what's going on, to create context. Um, and, the, and if you look at, you know, if you look at China, you know, collecting data from people, no problem. Most cases, no problem whatsoever. You can read your emails. Um, if you look at Germany, for instance, you know, give me a public, give me a private data. They will rather give you their firstborn child than their private data. So it's really, really different. Uh, so how how is it here? I mean, how do we deal with you know with, with data? How do I mean? We're all on social media. We nobody, none of us thinks about what's happening with the data. Who has access to the data? I mean, this is a terrible problem. But um, how is it really here? I mean. Uh, how can we deal with the data? How can we work with data without, you know, getting into into a gray zone? Is it is it easy? Is it not easy? I mean, is the data lying around? You know, we all know about Mitsu Bitsa, who is not giving out, you know, uh, the the data sitting on data, not giving it out because you know the, this person was collecting the data for 20 years, and then you make this person give you the data, then you they say, you know, come with the truck because all the data is printed out. You can you can you know can use it now. Um, how is it working here in the Balkans with data? Is it easy? So, yeah, uh, again, a good question. So the situation is it's related to the data security. And then, yeah, up to the, we can actually switch that into the, okay, we have two er eras there. The first one is up to the GDPR and after that, because that was extremely um, awareness raising point, okay? so. It changed a lot right now, and everyone is asking about data security. So before, no one cared. Okay, no one really cared. Uh, only if there there were some data which needed to be protected on the first hand, they were protected. And right now, everyone is asking about that. So there are so many uh, solutions right now. Just 
um, uh, solving the issues with data and right now I believe everything is changing accordingly to that and I guess in ensuing years we are going to have a lot of protection there so everything is going to be secured if you work it proper if you just follow the, the proper rules yeah uh, the rest of the gentlemen uh, do you agree with him everything is protected or no I don't I don't think everything is protected but uh, I don't I think that, that the new new generations or millennials don't care that much about about the, the their privacy. We saw that with the Facebook, that when they had a problem with the data giving to other company, their stocks went down for one or two days, and after that goes up. So basically, we cannot control that. And I think that in the end, people are not that interested in in in. in uh, creating the data to be totally private. We have some data that we want to, to conceal, but at the end, we cannot control it. I don't think so. All right. I, w I would love to continue. The yeah, the lawyer, of course, has to say something about data. You were no, like the only thing I can say is that uh, being more smart means also paying the price for it. And I think that this privacy and this, uh, this data controlling is just a price for living in a smarter city because be living in a smart city means being monitored, is being, uh, is means having push-ups in your phone because you're passing by some, uh, some discount stores and supermarkets. That's just the price for having it. If you don't want it, then you just don't want to live in a smart city. That's also your choice. But I would say it's totally natural. And entrepreneurs just need this data if they want to make your life smarter. Yeah, and if you want to solve the problems, you have to have some data. I mean, smart cities and digital transformation is an arms race. You know, there are countries which are making huge uh, steps forward. They are leapfrogging because they don't care so much about it. While the European continent is much more conservative, much more caring about the individual. It, you know, I don't know where the balance here really is. I, I think we have like two minutes left, maybe it is three. For example, two or three. So um, if you have a question to, to these brilliant gentlemen here with, with all their wisdom and all, all the knowledge, I would highly encourage you to actually raise your hand, maybe stand up because it's really bright up here. We don't really see you. Uh, so if you have a question, please stand up, ask them a question. Don't be shy. Ili da možda ako, ako nemate trenutno pitanja, pre toga pogledamo tablet anketu kratko, pa da onda ako je neko spremio pitanje, postavimo pitanja. U kom gradu biste voljeli da živite ako to nije Beograd, kada je reč o kvalitetu i organizovanosti urbanog života? New York, Tokyo, Seattle, Berlin, Singapur ili neki drugi? Dobro, to su odgovori, a da li sad imamo i ove odgovore sa procentima kako smo glasali? A najveći broj, kaže, neki drugi grad, ne sviđe se ovde našim posetiocima, ni jedan grad, naročito od ovi koji su ponuđeni. Između ponuđenih, Singapur je dobio najveći procenat glasova, to je možda iznenađujući odgovor, Berlin na drugom mestu, na New York na trećem, a tek onda Tokio i Seattle. Pa znate šta, Berlin definitivno nije pametan grad i to je dobra stvar jer nama da ite kako šansu da, da ih prestignemo jako, jako lako. Berlin definitivno nije jedan od tih pametnih grada u svijetu. Pa jeste, on je negde sinonim za taj organizovani život urban, a da li možda neko želi da da komentar? Pa ni jedan od ovih gradova nije na top 10 cities for living, ni na jednoj listi, tako da ne znam okay. zašto je ovo pitanje postavljeno, zna se koji su gradovi, Australija, Kanada, ovaj, Beč. Govorilo se o tom urbanom životu koji prati temu o kojoj mi danas govorimo na današnje celodnevne konferencije. Melbourne i Sijetli jesu urbani gradovi, ne možemo reći da su... Pa smo onda tako i birali te gradove. Da, da, znači top ten za život su neki drugi gradovi, a ne javi se spiska, tako da može to uzrok odgovora neki drugi. Hvala, da li sada imamo neko pitanje iz publike? Ja ne vidim ovde ni jednu ruku. Toliko što se tiče ovog panela, hvala gospodine Krisoli vama i vašim sagovornicima. Dami i gospodo, mi ćemo sada da idemo na ručak. Može aplauz, naravno. Vidimo se u sali tačno u 3.15. U 3.15 nastavljamo sa programom. Još jednom gospodine Krisoli, hvala.